presentation. <laughs> um, all right, so this is it. Thank you for coming. I'm going to talk today about the work I've been conducting for the past four years. Some of you might be aware, some might not. Um, but let's get straight into it. Um, most of us know about your, uh, protected areas in general as a key tool to reduce biodiversity loss um, and maintain biodiversity. Um, and we know that protected areas in general are used widely everywhere in a lot of different contexts and that their use and their implementation is expected to increase in the, in the next few decades. And, uh, but if you look, if we work in regions where, for example, we have to deal with lots of different species with different ecological requirements, or if you have to deal with different um, socioeconomic constraints, for example, um, and more, quite often you also have very limited resources, limited conservation resources to do that, it can be a bit daunting to know what choices to make about um, implementing these protected areas, what size, what shape, um, where to put them, and things like that. <coughs> so, this is pretty much what conservation planning aims to do. Right, conservation planning is the process, it's an approach, and it's a process of deciding where, how, and when to allocate limited, sometimes, often, conservation resources. Um, and this is also used to, um, for protected area design and implementation. So right now I'm just presenting quickly um, the latest published approach, um, or the latest published framework for conservation planning. I'm not asking you to remember all this. Um, but in a nutshell, what we, what conservation planners and uh, most conservation plans tend to do is that they start by scoping and costing the conservation plan, um, and all the way through um, engaging effect potential of people that can be potentially affected by our conservation actions, uh, through collecting adequate data, all the way through designing these protected areas. In the case of today, we're going to talk about marine protected areas, but same approach, and. Um, and then implementing these protected areas and finally uh, monitoring them, of course, and if needed, repeating the process. Um, so this, the, the good thing about conservation planning and systematic conservation planning is that we do that in a systematic way, which means that it gives us, an, um, um, a, tool, um, gives us a tool to sort of balance out, balance out all these trade-offs that I talked about earlier about biodiversity, social planning, and uh, funding constraints. What I want to draw your attention to today is that particular step here. I forgot to mention all these steps here don't have to be followed in sequence. Some of them can be followed in parallel. But that one here, spatial prioritization, is the actual step when we design protected areas, when we, um, cho when we choose where to put them, what's the size and what's the shape of these protected areas. And typically in, in uh, conservation planning, this is done with the help of uh, selection, reserve selection algorithms. Don't be put off by that word, it's just a word. Uh, so in a nutshell, these algorithms typically answer two sets of, two kinds of objectives. They try to tell you what would be the best appropriate, the, the best places to locate your reserves in a way that maximize biodiversity representation within these reserves while minimizing costs to potentially affected stakeholders. So this is how these reserve uh, um, selection algorithms work. And one of the foundations for uh, protected areas, or marine protected areas, um, based on such approach, is to collect adequate data to feed these algorithms or to feed this approach. And in the next um, couple of slides, I'm just going to go a bit deeper into why this is important to get the right data for conservation planning. <laughs> All right, that'll be right. So, why do we need biodiversity or ecological data for conservation planning? It's quite intuitive, that one. Well, first, because first of all, we want to maximize biodiversity representation within the protected areas that we are designing, right? So that makes sense. Uh, but the challenge is that perfect data on biodiversity or on species, for example, doesn't exist. Or if it exists, it would be really expensive to get a comprehensive view of all the species and all the biodiversity we have in the region. So what conservation planner ha um, planners have tended to do in the, in the last, like since it started, <laughs> um, is they use proxies to this data. So some of the proxies that are commonly used, for example, are other species. Uh, so collecting data on other species to have 
an idea of a particular other species. And the reason why we do that is like because the, the other species might be easier to collect data on um, or cheaper to collect data on. Another very widely used um, proxy or surrogate is habitats, for example. So we tend to collect data on habitats thinking that it will represent really well biodiversity or give us a good idea of biodiversity. Um, but there are a number of assumptions behind doing that. The first one is that if we design reserves that are uh, meant to represent a proxy, we think that ultimately it's going to represent well biodiversity because we collect the data from the proxy thinking it represents well biodiversity. Another assumption that Bob mentioned earlier is that as we collect more data on the proxy or more complex data on the proxy, we think that uh, well, it will probably be better at rep representing biodiversity. Why am I telling you all that? Why does it matter? Well, if we get this data wrong, we, what do we risk? We risk inadequate protection of what we want to protect. In this case, we want to protect biodiversity as a whole species. Um, we risk a false sense of achievement because we are going to measure our objectives ba based on the proxy, and if the proxy is ina inadequate, well, we're not meeting the biodiversity objectives. And of course, all this um, can lead to a waste of precious conservation resources. So that's quite intuitive, you know, biodiversity for conservation planning. But where, why do we need to collect socioeconomic data for conservation planning? We're talking about species and habitats and things like that. Well, like I said before, what we want by placing uh, this protected area or um, creating protected areas is we also want to make sure that the costs we're going to have at least impact to people that are in the region or that could be affected by the, con the conservation actions. And the idea behind doing that is that um, placing these protected areas in order to reduce impact on people is going to increase their support, um, therefore maybe their compliance with our conservation actions or protected areas, and also, of course, ultimately the effectiveness of the plans that we implement. Again, there are some challenges for us conservation planners here. Um, as some of you in the room know, our social ecological systems are quite complex. And uh, it can be a bit daunting sometimes to know what to focus on, because there's a lot going on there. So what we've tended to do, when I say we as conservation planners, what we've tended to do uh, in the past and in the present is to focus only on resource users as the potential affected stakeholders by protected areas, or by protected areas. And then we estimated the potential impact of reserving the places that um, where they extract resource, for example, as their opportunity cost, right? So the higher the resource use in a particular area, the higher will, the cost will be of protecting that particular area to stakeholders. And the assumptions behind that, behind using proxies of opportunity costs like these ones here, is that minimizing costs to stakeholders based on these proxies is going to minimize as well the negative impacts of our conservation actions on people. And avoiding impact um, on these particular users, extractive users, will potentially ensure compliance and uh, no harm to people. Again, why does it matter? What if we get this data wrong? Well, we risk of harming stakeholders, for example, displacing their resource use to other places that will cost them. We risk non-compliance and no support of our conservation actions, of our protected areas. Um, therefore, potentially a waste of our precious conservation resources again, and the false sense of achievement of our, of our objective of minimizing impact on stakeholders. So this basically highlights why getting data right for conservation planning is critical for, um, for the success of protected areas designed using such approach. The one context in which it's even more critical to get it right is tropical coral reefs, right? As most of you know, you know that tropical coral reefs uh, face a number of threats, some of which can be uh, mitigated by improving marine protected areas, some of which can't. And they also provide a lot of different ecosystem services and benefits to uh, thousands, millions of people. <laughs> but if you look a bit closer into what kind of countries uh, have coral reefs, we can see here with the Human Development Index, uh, very high and low in red, 
can see a lot of these countries that have coral reefs are in red, which means they're developing countries, right? And what this means is that developing countries in this context are really reliant on the coral reefs for their livelihoods, for their income, a bunch of things, and um, which makes them not only vulnerable to the threats happening to coral reefs, but also makes conservation planning very challenging in these countries, right? So in this context, in my thesis, I wanted to understand the advantages and limitations of the typical socioeconomic data and biodiversity data that, is used, that are used at the moment in conservation planning, and whether this apply, would apply to local scale conservation planning in developing coral reef countries. The reason why it's, I uh, focused on local um, scale is because in these countries, governments <coughs> it often devolves, so it makes sense to look at that scale. So I address this goal with uh, four, um, four data chapters and a few questions. The first one, I'm going to ask whether global conservation targets are compatible with local socioeconomic objectives and constraints in this context. Um, and also, I'm going to have a look at whether data can influence our ability to meet conservation and socioeconomic objectives. And then I looked at socioeconomic data. What kind of socioeconomic data would be adequate in such um, context? I asked whether fishing pressure data is, represents perceived fishing value as perceived by people, and we'll talk later about that. And um, I asked how we can potentially consider whole communities as the potential stakeholders involved, um, affected by marine stakeholders rather than just fishers. And then finally, I looked at what would be the cost effectiveness of different protected areas, marine protected areas, designed with a bunch of various proxies, social economic proxies, and uh, biodiversity proxies. So whether there was one combination of proxies that would give better results, as in maximizing biodiversity while minimizing costs to people. Right, first chapter, I looked at the objectives, and this has been published already in Conservation Letters a couple of years ago, so I'm gonna go briefly around, um, briefly through this, but if you want more information, feel free to ask me for the reference. All right, let's go to Wallis and Futuna. These are, um, so Wallis and Futuna is a territory, a French Polynesian uh, territory in the middle of the Pacific, as you can see here. And it's comprised of three uh, small islands separated by about 200 kilometers each, not each, but Futuna, Alfie, and Wallis. And the reason why I chose to look at these islands is because they have excuse me, extensive reefs, um, very diverse, a lot of biodiversity there, a lot of different habitats, coral reef habitats, and these reefs are also um, uh, fished quite a lot for subsistence, so people fish there with nets and spare gun. And what I wanted to do here, remember, I wanted to look at whether international conservation guidelines would be um, compatible with local socioeconomic constraints. So to do that, I created an indicative conservation plan, which is not something that is going to happen in the real world for the purpose of that research. And my conservation objective here was to protect, as per the uh, Convention for Biodiversity um, in 2003, to protect 20% of each habitat type for each of the three islands, while conflicting the less possible um, with um, social, um, social um, sorry, subsistence fishing ground in these three islands. So the way I did that, and I, I wanted to look at the trade-offs between these two um, objectives and constraints. The way I did that, did that is that I first split all my islands into a grid of planning units. This, each unit is going to be a potential reserve for each of these, these islands. And I designed planning units of two different sizes to look at their effect. I collected data on habitats, had two maps for each island, one map with a very high resolution, um, very high spatial resolution and thematic resolution, so a lot of different habitat types, and one map with, with, which was a bit coarser. So I had that for all islands. And for all islands, I also had um, the extent and location of fishing grounds. And so I designed protected areas, um, achieving both these, um, the objective and the socioeconomic constra constraints. And I progressively allowed more and more um, extent of fishing grounds for each island to be reserved, right? To look at the trade-offs between the two objectives. And this is what I found. 
So if you look at these graphs here, we have these three islands here, and we have on the x-axis the, the achievement of socioeconomic objective. So 100 here means that uh, none of the fishing grounds at all have been used, have been allowed to be reserved. And if we go, as we go towards zero, zero means that we allow in the reserve design all, any place on the fishing grounds to be reserved. So this is what it means. And on this axis here, we have the person conservation objective achieved. 100 means that all the, all the habitats are, uh, see their 20% representation target met. And zero means that none of the habitat types have been represented to 20%. And the key message here, what we can see, is that we do have trade-offs between the objectives. So achieving 100% of all social economic and conservation objectives is not possible. We do have trade-offs. I quantified these trade-offs. And this, the extent of these trade-offs varies with the size of the planet units we use and also the resolution of the data we use. So this sort of highlights very quickly, this highlights um, the fact that the data we use in conservation planning can have a big influence on what, how we achieve um, our conservation objectives. So this is basically what I said. And so next, in the next part of the talk, we're moving from Wallis, Aluka, and Switzerland to another part of the Pacific. And the reason why I'm changing study area here is because all the data that I wanted to collect for the subsequent chapters uh, was not available and was not, it was not easy to collect them for Wallis, Aluka, and Switzerland. So here we go. We move to the Madang Lagoon in Papua New Guinea. So Papua New Guinea here in the middle of the Coral Triangle. I'm sure some of you, most of you are familiar with that. And this is the lagoon here, again, the bigger lagoon, the coast here and the ocean here, and Madang situated here. And the good thing, the, the way that, the reason why this was a good study area for what follows is that the Madang Lagoon is increasingly diverse in habitats, in, biodiversity, in marine biodiversity, corals, um, life, and things like that, marine life. And also people uh, live all along the coast here, lots of different villages there. And these people here really are really reliant on the resource and on accessing the reef uh, for a bunch of ecosystem services and benefits and not just fishing. So that made kind of the ideal case study to look at the questions I'm going to talk about a bit later. And also, I've been lucky enough to be part of a, a very large international biodiversity expedition in 2012, which not only helped me logistically uh, to collect my data in the Madame Lagoon, but also provided me with a lot of data that I couldn't have had otherwise on biodiversity and species that occur in the Madang Lagoon. All right. The first thing that I had to do in the Madang Lagoon, because I'm going to use habitats as proxies of biodiversity for the rest of the talk, first thing I needed to do was to have habitat maps uh, for the Madang Lagoon. So I did that. I um, acquired a very high resolution satellite image, World View 2 here of the lagoon. So again, the coast is there and this is the open ocean on that side. I uh, delineated manually all the different um, habitats that I could visual, visualize there. So basically I was looking at different colors, different textures. And then I went in the field, of course, to ground truth what I thought what, was what. Um, so I visited a few, um, a few sites there, uh, diving and recording habitat data visited a lot of different habitats. Indeed, it was very, very diverse in habitats. Co uh, took a lot of photos and analyzed these photos. And what, what this allowed me to do was to create maps for the Madang Lagoon, um, a very high resolution um, habitat map for the Madang Lagoon. And I, the, um, I created different classifications for that map. So basically, I went from a very coarse classification of habitats with only four types. and a lot of other classifications, all the way to a very, very uh, precise and um, a very, very fine description of my habitats. And I am going to use these habitat maps in the rest of the talk. Right. Uh, okay. What was the next question I was asking? I was particularly interested in my project um, about in the, the type of social economic data of, of proxies that we use in conservation planning. <coughs> And um, to understand a bit why I was interested in that, we need to look a bit further into what, how this is used currently in marine conservation planning and uh, what we tend to do as conservation planners. All right. 
a quick look at the literature shows us that most of the time, the commonly used socioeconomic costs in conservation planning are based on the importance of areas for fishing in marine conservation planning. All right, so we use proxies of the importance of areas for fishing, such as distance, uh, catch, catch per unit effort, and we also use costs in terms of dollar value. So it could be for fishing as well, so how much does the area, um, how much does the area cost in terms of fishing revenue, and uh, also other things such as non-fishing. So this is used currently in marine conservation planning, and because coral reef conservation planning is still at, at, is at its infancy, um, what planners tend to do is to use these proxies in coral reef conservation planning. So I was interested in whether that was, that was actually relevant in that kind of context. So let's focus on this one, for example. What, what does it mean to use the importance of um, areas in terms of fishing? Well, if you look at these cartoons here, hope you like them because it took a while, uh, <laughs> we have on the left an area with a low fishing pressure or a small catch, whichever. And we have an area here with a high fishing pressure and a high catch. We can think intuitively that a fisher or someone who uses this area is going to somehow value this area here on the left but maybe it's going to value even more the area on the right. So there's more fish, so it catches more fish. And now if we reserve some of, if we, if we protect these areas, what we think is that this person here is going to be somewhat affected by the reservation or the fact that it can't access this area anymore. And this person here is going to be even more affected because it really values that place. So that's kind of the assumptions behind using such costs in conservation planning. But what we do typically in conservation planning, what data do we use? We use data on this. We use data on fishing pressure, we use data on catch, we use data on how much fish people get from it. But we haven't looked at whether this refers to this, whether people value more places that, are a lot of, that have a lot of catch and less places that have less catch. So in my first question, my third, uh, second data chapter, I was interested in looking at these aspects. So I asked whether catch data or fishing pressure data could represent well the perceived fishing value um, of fishes for these places. How did I do that? I went again um, to Medang Lagoon, and what you can see here is all the different villages along the coast, and this one here, the size of the circles is proportional to the size of the populations. This one here is the main uh, village. It's called Rewo, and I chose to focus on this particular village because I wanted to collect very comprehensive data, uh, socioeconomic data. And the reason as well is because Rewo, the Rewo community has their marine tenure which covers most of the lagoon, so that was um, a good bet. What I did there is I collected data on fishing pressure, so I did um, standard fishing surveys, um, and so I asked I went to landing site and asked fishers to um, draw on the map where they went fishing and I weighted the catch and I asked a bunch of other questions. And I also did some household surveys in Rio in which I asked um, households to show me on the map where were the main fishing grounds where uh, people go fishing in their household and how much each of these fishing grounds is valued for fishing for each household, right? So I had an indication of importance as perceived by the people themselves. <coughs> and I collected data for uh, different genders um, and different gears as well. I digitized all the maps. And then again, I used planning units. So I interpolated all the value of the cost data through all my planning units. And then I compared the different cost layers that I created and I designed reserves. I'm going to explain a bit more about that. All right, what did I find? So these here are the different cost layers that I used in the study. So on the left side, you can see the fishing pressure cost layers. So proximity to landing site is one cost layer that is often used uh, in marine conservation planning. So I looked at that. The number of fishers visiting each area for fishing. Uh, the total catch here. So the red is more catch, which means more costly for conservation planning. The average catch by unit per unit effort, similar. You know. And on the right side, we have my data on perceived fishing value of places. So a red area here 
means that more households perceive these places as of fishing value at all, right? And this is the actual fishing value using my interview data. So this place here has a very high fishing value um, for people, therefore high costs if we protect this place to people. So the first thing we can see by looking spatially and also a bit quantitatively sorry, at these cost layers is that it doesn't seem to be much relationship between them, right? It seems quite different if we look at them. And so I wanted to look at uh, correlations between all these different um, cost layers, and I found that there wasn't any between any pairs of comparisons, and especially specifically, there was no relationship between these data here and these data here, which means that potentially, um, if we use um, if we use proxy uh, if we use cost data based on fishing data, we might not actually produce impacts on people because people value other areas for fishing than the ones that have high costs. Um, and what I found as well, yeah, that's, that's what I said. All right, <laughs> sorry. So total catch, catch per unit effort of proximity as proxies can be poor proxies of the importance of fishing grounds um, to people. So this, is how, this has high implications for conservation planning. Um, now, you might want to say, but what do we do then? Which one do we use? Uh, should we actually use the perceived fishing value or some of the proxy ones? Well, what I think is that it really depends on your objectives when you want to implement your protected areas or design your protected areas. I think that if your objective is mainly to maintain, for example, uh, food security or income security, then maybe you want to look at the proxies that are usually um, used, such as catch for unit effort or catch. And if you want to minimize, to have a more comprehensive idea of the potential costs, maybe including social costs to people, maybe you want to use a combination of both, or maybe just the fishing value of people, of um, area. All right. Now, gaps for this research, and including further research I would like to perform, I uh, would like to look, this was short-term um, data collection, as typically done in conservation planning. And what I would like to do is to um, do the did that kind of um, data collection like over a year or a couple of years, for example, to have a more comprehensive data set of fishing pressure and look at whether that ends up, ends up matching up with uh, the perceived fishing value of areas for people. And if not, if there are still differences, what are the factors that can explain these differences? And this work is uh, currently in revision, in revision for conservation letters. Okay. Okay, stepping back a bit to the next chapter. Let's look at take a um, look at the broad picture and look at a coral reef social ecological system. So we just talked about fissures, but we're stepping back. So here, for example, we have a beautiful coral reef, and the way social ecology systems uh, social ecological systems can be described as would be described as providing a bunch of ecosystem services and benefits to people, which contribute to their well-being. And on the other side, we have the structure of social ecological systems that determine the kind of and dynamics of human impact on the reefs. And in conservation planning or in a conservation context, and yet yeah, lots of different interactions um, between these components, in a conservation planning context, uh, if we want to mitigate some of these impacts, uh, if we want to protect coral reefs, we're going to design protected areas, and that may affect the flow of ecosystem services and benefits to people. But there's not one type of marine protected areas, right? There's different. Um, there's a range of restrictions that we can apply in protected areas. Uh, if we look at the small small restrictions, we have gear-specific restrictions, for example. And you can see that this kind of restriction is mainly going to affect the benefit, the fishing benefit, and therefore probably fishers as the main stakeholders. If we look at low take areas, one step further, um, this affects probably all the resource extraction uh, benefits, and probably more than just fishers, fishers and all the other people who extract resources from the reefs. If we look at no access protected areas, which is the most extreme way, um, well, this is definitely going to affect more than just fishers. Uh, it's going to affect benefits that are extractive and non and non extractive, and also probably um, fishers and the broader community. So, in this context, 
looking at these kind of restrictions. I was interested in there, I was interested there, in um, how we could consider whole communities as, as potential affected stakeholders by conservation actions rather than just fishers. So to do this, again, Rewa and Madame Lagoon, I first started by holding focus groups, and in the focus groups I was interested in knowing what kind of benefits people derive from reefs. Um, so how do they use the reef? Why do they access the reef for? So I did that, I collected some information. And then um, because there is no approach that allows us to collect spatial information on the derived benefits um, and coral reefs, um, I designed one and I used, basically I did household surveys and participatory mapping and I split my interviews in games because I found that it was really helping people um, to be engaged in the project, project and be responsive to the project. And so the first game is the card game. Remember I talked about um, having an idea of the, all the benefits that people derive from ecosystem services. In the card games I had picture cards with each representing each benefit that people told me about in the focus groups. And in each household I was talking, I was asking the same question, what benefits do you derive, not that way, but what benefits do you derive uh, from ecosystem uh, ecosystem services and benefits, and I was presenting the cards to probe them, and people had to select which benefits were relevant to their household and rank them in order of importance to them or to their household. And the next game was called the drawing game, which was a participatory mapping um, exercise, and presenting each card in order of importance that people selected in the previous game. I was asking them to show me or draw on the map where were these places where they derived these different benefits for ecosystem services. And then in the token games, um, for all these drawn places for each benefit, I was distributing a set amount of tokens to, pe to these people. Um, they could be rocks or shellfish, whatever was available at the time. And I asked people to distribute these tokens um, in these areas that they drew, and the more tokens on an area means that this area was more important for that benefit, and the less token means that the area was less important for that benefit, for each household, and for each benefit. So that worked quite well, and I got, I got a lot of maps and results, which I digitized, and then again I interpolated um, <coughs> my data from planning units for reserve design. Okay, that sounds a bit complicated. What was the first thing I found? First thing I found is that indeed people value and access the reef for a lot of different uh, ecosystem services and benefits, including fishing, quite intuitively, recreation as well, um, aesthetics, people go hang around uh, because they find it pretty. Um, they use the reef for traditional medicine as well, so typically in Madame, for example, they would collect algae such as cholera, which they would cook and eat um, to cure colds or south rot. And lime, so what is lime? Uh, people there chew betel nut, and they chew betel nut with uh, lime, which is crushed, typically made of crushed coral or crushed shellfish, which they collect on the reef. So that was one particular ecosystem service that they would get, uh, or benefit that they would get from accessing the reef. And biodiversity, education, spirituality. Now if we look spatially and at what were the different places that were valued for these different benefits, Here's what we get for fishing, for example. We have here on that map of the lagoon, the red area means that a lot of people value that place for fishing, and then these places for fishing, and the yellow areas mean that less people value these places for fishing. Doesn't tell us how much they value it, just whether they did or not. So recreation, you can see the places were a bit different. Aesthetics, a bit different as well. Traditional med medicine, Line and so on. So the key message here um, is that there was a lot of variation, um, spatial variations between the different places that people value and access uh, for different benefits and services. So from this, I created cost layers, um, like in previous chapters, with a higher cost means that it's a place that has a high value for a particular benefit. And this is what I created here for, for each benefit. The red areas here means that this area is very much valued for this benefit by the whole community, uh, by the community as a whole, and that reserving that place uh, in the protected areas will have a high impact, that's the assumption, uh, to people. 
Right, so again, lots of different cost layers. And then using all these cost layers, I've designed protective areas that aim at um, representing habitat, um, marine, uh, marine habitats, sorry, while minimizing each of these costs here. And this one I didn't talk about, but this one is an aggregated cost using all these different cost layers that I used as well. Okay, what did I find? Okay, so this here, on this graph here, I'm going to show you um, the incidental costs of minimizing one type of, of benefit, one type of costs um, in my protected area design. So on the x-axis here, we have a, a cost, um, an indicator of the total cost of marine protected areas. And for each bar at the top, each color bar corresponds to a, one benefit. So for example, here, if we do not use any cost layer and we just reserve areas that protect 20% of um, coral reef habitats, we can see that this has a, a lot of different incidental costs to all these benefits here. And potentially we're not doing things quite right. Okay, now what happens if I use fishing as a cost to minimize? Well, we can still see that there's not a lot, but still incidental costs to other benefits. So fishing is represented here and it's minimum and then we'll still see a lot of costs to um, other important benefits. And I did that for every single benefit. I minimized um, the impact on each of them. And you don't need to understand everything there. But key point here is that it does incur a lot of different um, incidental costs to other benefits. And that fishing still seems interestingly to be one of the best proxies to minimize all the benefits together. Now what happens if I use an aggregated um, layer com um, combining all benefits together and I want to minimize all benefits together, well, I find that this is our best bet because it minimizes all the costs apart from one here that we need to look further into. Uh, but it, it is the best bet for um, what we want to achieve, which is minimizing costs to all benefits. What did we learn? Well, we learned that different places are valued for different reasons, so we may want to take that into account in conservation planning. We learned that marine protected areas designed to reduce fishing opportunity costs may affect access to other benefits, so maybe in such context, it would be good to look into these things. And we learned that combining information on all the ecosystem services and benefits derived by people would be our best bet in, our, in that context. Now this was a new approach, and the first to explicitly incorporate ecosystem services in such contexts as well, as perceived by people. And I identified a few gaps while doing that. Um, well, first, that was a simplified version of what we need to do, but I would like to know a bit more about how are these different benefits really affected by marine protected areas, because we know that um, it might affect some positively, some negatively, some might be um, uh, displaced, or things are created as well, so I would like to go um, a bit more into that. And also, I only use them as costs, but maybe some of them can be used as objectives in conservation planning as well and help us um, gain the community support. And this is currently in review in PLOS One. So hey, last bit. Um, okay, so <coughs> now what I wanted to do, the last thing I wanted to do, was to use all these different proxies that are commonly used in conservation planning and look at whether in this context, uh, marine protected areas used, uh, marine protected areas designed using all this combination of proxies would be um, effective at maximizing biodiversity while minimizing the cost of interest to stakeholders. And ultimately, I wanted to know whether there was an ideal set of proxies. That would be great, wouldn't it? Um, all right. To do this, so I had to compile a lot of biodiversity proxies and I had to compile a bunch of socioeconomic data proxies. So based on what I did before in the previous chapters, I used habitat type as, bi as biodiversity proxies and I used, I used my different maps of different resolutions for that. And I use a lot of different socioeconomic data, which are typically the ones, I mean, basically the ones I use um, that are commonly used in marine conservation planning on fishing pressure. And then I also um, calculated how much it costed me to collect all these different data sets. Because remember, we're also looking at whether 
using most ex more expensive combinations will provide better results. And then I designed the range predicted areas based on all these combinations of proxies. And to measure their effectiveness, I needed reference data, of course, for each of its the biodiversity data and socioeconomic data. So what did I use as reference biodiversity data? I used georeference pieces lists, which were basically lists that were provided to me um, that were collected at, loca at different locations in the Madame Lagoon during the expedition. And I had species with on algae, coral, fish, and invertebrates. And the fish part is already published, and I'm co author on that in the Zoo Taxa last year. And as a reference socioeconomic um, data set, I used the aggregated costs for all benefits that I derived in the previous chapter. So I wanted to look at whether all these marine protected areas there. Um, how good they were, all these combinations, how good they were at maximizing representation of this while minimizing these costs there. The next slide is going to be busy, so don't worry, we're going to go through this. This is the last, the last busy one. Okay, these are my results. So, before we look at the graph, we have a lot of biodiversity proxies here represented by different symbols, different socioeconomic proxies represented by different colors. And in this graph, then we looked at combinations of each of them, uh, protected areas designed um, using combinations of each of them. And on this graph here, we're looking at each combination. Each point is a protected area. Uh, is protected areas design each combination. And on the x-axis here, we have it's called SEI social economic cost. What the hell is SEI? SEI is called is the surrogacy effectiveness index, which is an index that I created to measure the effectiveness of these protected areas at either minimizing cost or maximizing um, biodiversity representation. And the way this works, basically, as you go towards the one, it means that it's close. Um, your protected areas is close to designing it with the actual. Uh, reference data set, so it's very good. If you go close to zero, it means that it's not much better than random. And if you go below zero, it means it's really, really bad at representing either biodiversity or minimizing socioeconomic costs. So socioeconomic costs here and biodiversity benefits here. Uh, like I said, each point is one protected area using all these proxies. Does it still make sense? <laughs> and um, this here is looking at one particular taxa, which was fish. Remember, I had four taxa as, represent, as a reference biodiversity data set. So, wait for it. Okay, so we don't want, don't really want points there, but we want points towards that end here. Make sense? We want protected areas that achieve both goals. Wait for it. Here it is. Horrible. Um, okay, so what do we have here? Each taxa, algae, corals, fish, invert. Don't look too much into detail. What we're looking at here and what we want to look for is basically whether, um, for example, blue crosses are always in the top right corner or always there or always there for each taxa. And we want to look also at whether, you know, yellow um, square. Uh, yellow squares are always at the same in the same corner, are always achieved the same uh, objectives the same way. We can see first, uh, first of all that it's not really the case. It's a bit messy, isn't it? Um, and the second thing we want to look at is whether more expensive data sets uh, will provide will be always in this corner here. So will provide a lot of benefits um, to biodiversity and socioeconomics. Uh, the way we do that is looking at that end. And that end, so these ones are more, a bit more expensive. So if you look at, uh, I don't know, blue crosses or blue triangles, well, I don't see any blue cross around there or blue triangle here, and they're always all over the place. So what this means, what does it mean? What this means is that the effectiveness of different given combinations of proxies are representing biodiversity while minimizing costs is very variable. You can't say this combination is the one. You're going to use that always in conservation planning. So this is very, very important. Also, what we saw is that it's not because you collect expensive data that it's going to give you uh, better results. So again, we need to 
revise how we see things when we use data and conservation planning. Um, trends are hard to identify, we saw that. The effectiveness of most tested areas designed with proxies depends on a lot of different variables. And we also showed previously in another paper uh, published a couple of years ago that it also varies with the method we use to test, to test that effectiveness. Uh, the selection algorithm that is used, also the spatial scale. Uh, so it's all a big mess and we need to worry a bit more about what the assumptions that we put into that. Um, yeah, so that's what I just said. All right, summary. What was my main aim? My main aim was to sort of understand the advantages and limitations of all these different proxies that are currently used in marine conservation planning um, and see whether they would be um, um, relevant to local scale coral reef conservation planning in the countries we talked about. I found that current international conservation targets that are based on habitats are incompatible as such with local context and that the achievement of objectives, conservation or socioeconomics, um, and the, the extent of the trade-offs depends on the data we use. I found also that commun commonly used proxies of fishing opportunity costs do not reflect necessarily the location and importance of fishing grounds to, to fishers. So this is quite important. I found that the costs, uh, the um, opportunity costs or conservation costs based on fishing are important, but probably not sufficient in such context, such context, sorry, and that incorporating maybe access to valued ecosystem services and benefits could probably help us make things a bit better. And I found finally that the effectiveness of protected areas design using um, such proxies that are commonly used um, vary in the way they meet socioeconomic and conservation objectives uh, with a lot of different interacting factors that someone will need one day to tease out. <laughs> All right, just uh, very quickly, um, major implication in general for con conservation planning in these countries. Um, we found that common, yeah, commonly used objectives, biodiversity and socioeconomic data in marine planning do not necessarily, are not necessarily relevant in coral reef countries in the context at least we looked at. And um, just a few... Um, very wide recommendations here for uh, conservation planning in such countries. Um, I recommend that we really look at the objectives that we set, uh, make them flexible, realistic, adapted also to the context. We can measure them and make them explicit. Um, but again, that's all in the paper that you uh, didn't present too much. I recommend that social economic assessments in, such, in uh, such countries and in conservation planning be more comprehensive. Uh, maybe we want to consider and engage the broader community rather than just resource users or just fishers. And as for the data that we use, it um, would be really good to question every time in every conservation plan the relevance of it in regards to the objective we have rather than just using what's being done without um, considering assumptions. Uh, test the assumptions in a similar context or at least state them in conservation plans so that we know what we're doing. Okay, most of this, um, no, some of this has been already published. Um, so you can see the um, outputs of my, um, of my different chapters here. Two of them have been uh, presented at international conferences. A few other outputs from my thesis. And below there are other outputs dr uh, done during my candidature but that do not um, relate necessarily to my thesis. I really want to thank a lot of people for that project. Um, first of all, my founders and the people who helped me with the logistics um, really, really, really insist on thanking the real world community in Papua New Guinea and Madame Gun. They've been really uh, fantastic with the, uh, helping me setting up the project and they've been very engaged and really, um, they, they were happy to participate. And, really responsive to my project, so I really thank these people, my assistants in the field as well, and um, Simon here, which is this chief, the real world chief, who's a bit of my real world dad as well, so um, big thanks to him. My supervisor, Bob, here in the room, you relate. Louisa Evans, a surgeon director from the Institut de Recherche pour le Développement. Uh, Louisa Evans from, from, from the University of Exeter. And in particular, I want to thank um, Christina, Pip, and uh, Natalie here 
I don't know if any of them are in the room. Um, but basically, these are the people who helped me dive into the new field of social sciences, and I really want to thank them for that. The conservation planning group, most of us are there, yes. Um, and friends, family, and chickens who helped me keep my sanity. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>